Britain's vote to leave the European Union, I'm going to try and draw a parallel between that vote over there and the election here. After all, Donald Trump is running very much against the establishment. Is there such a parallel? Joining us now is the man who is the driving force behind the British leave vote. His name is Nigel Farage. He's the former UK Independence Party leader. And there he is, joining us this morning from Cleveland. Nigel, welcome to the program. Good to see you, sir. Thank you very much. Is there a parallel? I, I think there is, by the way. Uh, I think that your vote yeah. in Britain was anti-establishment, and I think the Trump vote here is anti-establishment. What say you? Uh, so do I. I mean, I think that our political class in Westminster, in London, uh, increasingly had just got out of touch with opinion out there in the country. And I hear echoes of that here, where, you know, Washington, the Beltway, kind of not really in touch with the way middle America, real America feels. And crucially, the reason that we got Brexit, despite the fact that almost the entire establishment told us we shouldn't do this, it'd be a mistake, the sky would fall in, we'd all be poor, we'd finish up living in caves. And in the end, the reason we, wo <laughs> the reason we won was because we motivated the little people. We motivated the people who have not voted in any election for the last 20 years. They've given up with the system, and yet they saw with this Brexit vote they could actually change things. And I think this... I think if the Trump campaign can reach out to the disaffected blue-collar workers who probably aren't voting for anybody at the moment, but if he's got a message that speaks to them, that says things can change, then I think if you get them out to vote, then I think Trump can win. Two questions. You used to lead the UK Independence Party and you left. So question number one is, what are you doing now? Number two, why are you here? Are you advising the Donald Trump campaign by <laughs> any chance, Nigel Farage? <laughs> I was a businessman and I got into politics because I thought our entanglement with the European project was bad for democracy, bad for our country, and I wanted my country back. We forced the referendum. Without UKIP, it would never have happened. We got the referendum. We won the referendum. I think I've done my bit. Uh, why am I here? Well, I was invited. And a lot of people here want to know, how did you beat the establishment? How did this Brexit vote, which nobody in the Western world thought was going to happen, how did you do it? And as I say, it's a simple story. It's about motivating the little people, the ordinary people, and saying to them, you go down to that polling station, you can change history. We've, I have expressed a very strong opinion about Angela Merkel on this program here in America. My opinion is this. I think she ruined Europe. I think she changed Europe forever without asking anybody else in the European Union. Uh, am I coming on too strong, Nigel? No, you're not. Here's the irony. The European project, when it was founded back in the 1950s, was designed to contain Germany. You know, we've had, we, we'd had two disastrous world wars caused by the Germans, and the idea was, is that the club would contain Germany so that Germany could not become the powerful dominant force. And it is now a German-dominated Europe, uh, and whether it's the Eurozone and the miseries in the Mediterranean with youth unemployment rates running in some countries at over 50%, or what she did last July when she said, as many migrants that want to cross the Mediterranean and come to Europe, you're all welcome. And she was doing that not just on behalf of Germany, but actually on behalf of the whole of the EU. I think it was the biggest policy failure we've seen in the Western world for many, many decades. Can I ask a question about me? Um, I have recently become an American citizen. I have renounced my British original nationality. You're yeah. a very English guy. <laughs> what do you make of someone like me? Um, why would you want to do that? No, look, come on. I, mean, you know, I, happen, I happen to think that uh, if you're born English, uh, you won the greatest prize in the world. Uh, and I personally wouldn't want to surrender it. Uh, but hey, this is a great country too. I asked Margaret Thatcher that question many, many, many years ago. And she said, why yeah. don't you come back? I was expecting the same response from you, but I didn't get it. <laughs> uh, well, no, no, no. You've obviously left us and you're not coming back. But if you want to, um, as an American citizen, come back to us. Um, I'm sure we'd we'll be very generous. <laughs> very kind. You're a good man. And I put you on the spot and I know I did. Right. <laughs> Nigel Farage, welcome to America. It's one hell of a place, let me tell you. This guy, come here. Come here, Nigel. Come here. This guy. You know, they go around calling me Mr. Brexit, and I said, there's only one real... How are you, Nigel? It's a pleasure. What a great...
What a, what a job he's done. Now, if I don't get there, he's still going to be number one. If I get there, I may supersede him. I think you will. I think you will. You so we'll see you in a couple of seconds. Thank you. What a great honor. Still here with Lou Dobbs, and look who just joined us. The British politician, Nigel Farage, the guy who is credited with having the UK exit the EU. No one said that. People never thought it was going to happen, and what do you know it did? Kind of like people saying Donald Trump would never be the Republican nominee, and yet here we are tonight. Are there a lot of similarities, Nigel, between yeah. us and you guys right now? Yeah, there are. I mean, one of the things that happened was that London, a professional political class living in London, uh, kind of had lost touch with ordinary people out there, particularly the rest of England and Wales. That's the first similarity. You can think in Washington, there's a feeling many in Washington don't really get what middle America's been living through for the last few years. That's the first one. The second one, I'm less sure of, we'll see. But the reason we won the Brexit vote is the experts said the turnout would be 58, 60%. It was 73%. Wow. Yeah, and a lot of people who had never voted in their lives literally were turning up at polling stations and saying, what do we do? How do we vote? And that's because we inspired them. We said to them, look, by voting for this, you can change your lives, you can make things better. And the question is, can Trump reach that blue-collar vote in America who's not had it good for the last few years? And if he can, he'll win. In other words, this crosses party line. I you think? think? It does. I mean, I mean, you know, for us, our vote was coming as much from the left of politics as it was from the right of politics. And if I'm right, didn't Ronnie Reagan do a bit of this sort of 35 years ago? Well, and Nigel is being modest by not mentioning his dressing down of the European Parliament. <laughs> He'll go down in history as the guy who led the Brexit and made possible the freedom and independence of uh, the UK. But I've got to tell you, for some of us, that moment in which you, you, you simply took apart the European Union Parliament and, uh, and exposed uh, their, their arrogance. You, uh, it was a magnificent moment, and I've just got to just say thank you for that and, and compliment you, uh, uh, in addition to, of course, achieving the UK independence once again. Well, you know what? I turned up there, we just won a referendum, and far from learning a lesson, all they wanted to do was scream abuse at me, so I thought, you know what? You're going to get some of it back, guys, and they did. I, you know, it, the similarities are striking. Uh, it's as though the entire world has said, enough with the elite, enough with the people that don't understand what it's like yeah. to struggle. Well, I mean, what's happened is we've gone into this period where the big corporates, big business and big politics operates together. We're not living in free market capitalism. We've moved away from that. And what we've seen is the rich get richer. So it's crony capitalism. It's, it's not free market capitalism. Absolutely. Abso in my view, absolutely. And for ordinary people, their living standards have been going down, not up. So there is something wrong here. We've got to do something about it. It's extraordinary that Donald Trump, who we're uh, uh, watching, be celebrated as the party's nominee here tonight. Uh, this man has connected with the very people you're describing. Uh, working men and women, our middle class. You know, I, I'm, by the way, I'm from a generation of Americans who said, you know, we were raised to think there isn't such a thing as class in America. Now, group and identity politics talk about, uh, you know, if, if this is a revolution uh, to the value, to return to the values that made the country great. Respect uh, for one another, dignity in every job. Uh, it's an exciting moment for us. Whether Donald Trump can carry that through to victory in November, we'll be finding out. But it's a, there's an excitement that is showing up in the polls and showing that he can win. In some ways, did this have to happen? In other words, the pendulum had swung so far yeah. in favor of political correctness, uh, handouts, etc., that the people are saying, enough, we need to take our country back. But it's also careerism. You know, so yeah. many people in Western politics now, they dream about being politicians whether they're at school and college. They go into it. And one of the reasons they don't confront tough issues is they don't want to take risks. Get this is a great honor for me. I am going right now to invite onto the stage the man behind Brexit and a man who led brilliantly the United Kingdom Independence Party in this fight and won despite all odds, despite horrible name calling, to 
despite so many obstacles. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Nigel Farage. with a message of hope and a message of optimism. It's a message that says, if the little people, if the real people, if the ordinary decent people are prepared to stand up and fight for what they believe in, we can overcome the big banks. We can overcome the big banks. And we did it. We made, we made June the 23rd our Independence Day when we smashed the establishment. And we did it. Everybody said we'd lose. And what did we see? We saw experts from all over the world. We saw the International Monetary Fund. We saw Moody's. We saw Standard & Poor's. We saw global leaders giving us project fear, telling us that if we voted not to be run, by a bunch of unelected old men in Brussels. Yeah, well, it's okay. They don't like me either, so it doesn't really matter, does it? But they told us our economy would fall off a cliff. They told us there'd be mass unemployment. They told us investment would leave our country. And David Cameron, then our Prime Minister, but no longer, told us we might even get World War III, and we saw the commentariat, and we saw the polling industry doing everything they could to demoralise our campaign. On the day of the vote itself, that morning, they put us 10 points behind. And actually, they were all wrong. And they were wrong because what the Brexit campaign did is we reached those people who've been let down by modern global corporatism. We reached those people. We reached those people who have never voted in their lives, but believe by going out and voting for Brexit, they can take back control of their country, take back control of their borders, and get back their pride and self-respect. Now the big card, the big card the Prime Minister decided to play in the referendum is he got a foreign visitor to come to London to talk to us. Yes, we were visited by one Barack Obama. And he talked down to us. He treated us as if we were nothing. One of the oldest functioning democracies in the world. And here he was telling us to vote Remain. So I, having criticised, having criticised and condemned his behaviour, I could not possibly tell you how you should vote in this election. But, but,
I think that you have a fantastic opportunity here with this campaign. You can go out. You can beat the pollsters. You can beat the commentators. by doing what we did for Brexit in Britain. We had our own people's army of ordinary citizens who went out and delivered leaflets, who went to meet people where they worked and where they socialised, who convinced and inspired people to go out if this was the one and only time in their life and to vote for change. So my advice to you, if you want change in this country, you better get your walking boots on. You better get out there. if enough decent people are prepared to stand up against the establishment. Thank you very much. The man behind Brexit, he made it happen. He campaigned hard to make sure Britain cut its ties with the European community, and it worked. Now there are reports that Nigel Farage is helping Donald Trump make it to the White House by helping him prepare for next week's debate. Whether you like Mr. Farage or not, he is very good at that debate thing. He joins us now out of Strasbourg, France. Nigel, very good to have you. Put these rumors to rest. Are you Thank or you. are you not helping Donald Trump? I'm coming out this weekend for the second debate, um, and I'm coming out as a guest, I'm coming out as a commentator, uh, but you know what, uh, the advice I've got for Donald Trump, I don't need to give to him face to face, I can give it to you right now on this show, it's very simple, the Clinton team analysed that Trump is a proud man, proud of his achievements, proud of himself and proud of his family, and that if you attack him, on his record, if you try and tear to bits, you know, his business empire and his past, he will defend himself. And my advice to Donald Trump is dead simple. Do not be accused of financial impropriety by the Clintons. Do not be told you're a misogynist by a woman whose Clinton Foundation has taken money from Saudi Arabia. Rise above. Don't get in, just don't get involved in some sort of terrible catfight, rise above it and tell the American people why you are the candidate for change. But what you're saying is don't be on defense, be on offense, but part of getting on offense is to be clearly offended by the criticism that Hillary leveled at him. Now, how does he balance that between looking thin-skinned, as some said he did in that first debate, by focusing on every slight when he could have just, you know, sloughed it off and zeroed in on the attack on her, as he did, by the way, in the first 20 or so minutes of that debate. Oh, the first 20 minutes, uh, I thought he was tremendous. I, mean, I was hearing somebody standing to be American president who was talking a language I have not heard since Reagan. He was talking about cutting taxes. He was talking about giving people incentives. He was talking about the American dream, allowing people to get on. He was great in that first section. And then she very cleverly and very cynically, and with that horrible smug expression on her face, went for him personally, and he sought to defend himself in front of the American public. And Donald, I'd say this to you, you know, don't take abuse from a Clinton. Look at their track record in a whole raft of areas. Forget about her, ignore the criticisms, Go out there, connect with ordinary people. You've got some messages on tax cutting. You've got some messages on controlling borders and security in an age of terrorism that people really do want to hear. Now, um, your definition of smug might be confident, but we'll leave that out uh, aside and get your sense of how he responds on this tax thing. Um, she has already pointed out that he bragged about being very smart, not having to pay uh, so much in taxes, if any, if those uh, indications are right. But you argue that he should turn it around and say you're a fine one to be talking about financial propriety. Is that the gist of it? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's so typical of the Hillary hypocrisy, isn't it? She attacks Trump over his tax arrangements, knowing, of course, before the leak, funny how she knew beforehand, isn't it? But attacking him for what is a perfectly legal part of American tax law. You when think she had a heads up on those release forms? You think she had a heads up on those release forms? I am.
am absolutely certain of it. And come on, just look at what's happened since she made those claims. But now we know that the Clintons themselves in 2015 registered a capital gains loss, which they can carry over. And OK, there are two more noughts on the figure with Trump. He's a bigger financial player than the Clintons. But the fact is that all these things that Hillary accuses Trump of, she is guilty of herself. And I would say to Donald Trump, you know, do not take moralizing lessons from the Clintons on money, laugh her off, the American public will get it, and explain to them how. You want to help business, you want to help industry, you want to cut taxes, that you actually believe in America and are proud to be patriotic and will make it a safer country. Do those things, rise above her jibes, rise above, and I repeat it, her smug expression, and you will win this next debate. All right, you do not seem to be a huge fan of Hillary Clinton, but uh, we'll see. Maybe I missed something. But um, Nigel, bottom line, you are saying whatever advice you're offering, you just offered it right now, that you do not expect to be personally helping him with the debate. Uh, whether I do or whether I don't is irrelevant. I've just told you absolutely from my heart. It's not I irrelevant to me. Our to viewers want to know. They, a lot of them really like you. Now, if, if it turns out one of the best debaters on the planet, and that's coming from people who like you, any, uh, is he advising Donald Trump? Listen, if they want my advice, I'm available. It's All just right. as simple as that. Because and it's set on. off alarms in This France, election is simple. All right. This, uh, th well, all over the place. Sure. But this election is now simple. Do you want things to carry on the same, or do you want change? And Trump represents change. All right. Nigel, always good seeing you. Thank you very, very much. Nigel Farage, the man who made Thank Brexit you. possible when everyone and every poll seemed to say it wasn't going to happen. And he say. Thanks. Led the UK Independence Party to a victory during Brexit. Yeah, but then it supported U.S. President-elect Donald Trump in his quest for the White House. That's right. And after meeting with Mr. Trump just yesterday, President-elect Trump, how does Nigel Farage compare their victories? And what does he think of current U.S.-U.K. relations going forward? The leader of the UKIP party joins us now. Thanks for being here, Nigel Farage. You have been all over the news. I asked you this before. What's it like to be on cloud nine uh, forever i mean with brexit and this what's it been like for you i mean 2016 it's the year of political revolution i mean i've been dreaming of this for a couple of decades because i've always known that whatever our political class and their friends in the media and the big businesses whatever they do and say and want is not the same as what ordinary hard-working taxpayers want and what you've seen this year is just ordinary decent people the little people mm -hmm. who've said we've had enough we won't change. Now, you predicted the Brexit, and you, you told Parliament that it was going to happen. They yeah. laughed at you. You predicted that Donald <laughs> Trump would win. They laughed at you. What did you see that other people didn't see? Uh, it's, it's all to do with opinion polls. They're wrong. Why are they wrong? Because they don't measure the non-voter. You know, the man or woman who've never voted in their life who decide, you know what, I'm going to go out and vote for Trump. They can't measure these people. Mm -hmm. And if they ring them up, and say, look, would you, you know, join our list? They're probably going to get, uh, you know, verbal down the phone before <laughs> right. it's slammed down. Secondly, because of the way society's evolved, because of the, the, the domination of the liberal left media, people are now nervous about expressing conservative views. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they'll say one thing to a pollster right. and do another thing when it comes to the polling booth. That was one big reason. The other reason was, you know, what Trump was offering just like Brexit, was a kind of once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to change a system that has not been benefiting ordinary no, people. That's sure. so right. The invisible voter, people really under underestimated that. You met with Mr. Trump yesterday I at did. Trump Tower yeah. post-winning this election. What was that conversation like? He was uh, thoughtful, uh, reflective. Uh, I mean, you know, just think, what he, I mean, Hillary too, just think what they've been through. I mean, this has been yeah. the most astonishing, mm -hmm. vicious election campaign. I mean, that, that second debate in St. Louis, yeah. it, was, it was almost hard to watch. I mean, it, 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 it was really, really down there, wasn't yeah. it? Hard and, 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 and vicious. Um, but I think he, um, I'll tell you what, for a man of 70, he's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I mean, those last few days of the campaign, he was doing six rallies. Yeah. Now, I know from Brexit, you know, what it's like to be out there. So, I mean, his, his stamina is extraordinary. And believe me, he's not been idling for the last couple of days. Sure. He was talking about various ideas that he's got, and he is desperate to help ordinary Americans. Do you Americans think he's surprised that it went world. his way? Uh, when you're leading something like that, you're so full on that at the moment the polls close, you sort of think, 
to yourself what's going to happen. Your, your confidence almost goes. It, it happened to me on, on the Brexit. Look, I just think he's thrilled. And, and when you look at the number of electoral college votes he got, actually, it was a landslide. And some people in America, however, are not thrilled. We're seeing protests. Ah, yes. Uh, did, have you, did you see that after Brexit? And what do you oh. make of these protests to an election result? Oh, oh, we've seen protests led by people like Bob Geldof and various rock stars who I haven't got much time for. Um, and yeah, they've been out protesting. Now, I think, looking at the people outside Trump Tower yesterday, I think they're the same people. Same people. No, <laughs> professional I protesters. I were at the Brexit yeah, protest. I think they were flown over. <laughs> Let's talk about Brexit. Uh, there's a lot of concern in international markets. We've been hearing trouble in China, then buying back their own stock. Then everyone's pointing to the European Union and Britain's exit from, from uh, in Brexit. It's going to cause international turmoil. How do you decouple uh, the UK from the European Union cleanly where it doesn't you rattle know, the world? I've just never heard so much rubbish in all my life. You know, we're looking through the wrong end of the telescope. The idea that the European Union is good for economics mm. is nonsense. <laughs> it's the most over-regulated part of the world. It's got the highest unemployment rates, the lowest growth rates, the maddest energy policy. And look, nowhere in history have you had to be in a political union to buy and sell motor cars from each other? The whole thing is based on a false premise. And these arguments that we get, mm -hmm. and we're getting them from Goldman Sachs, and we're getting them from J.P. Morgan. And why? Because the European Union allows mega businesses to effectively write their own rules for the industry, mm -hmm. which puts out of business small and medium-sized competitors and gives the customer worse value for money. And I, by the way, I've helped to get Britain out of the European Union. I now want to get Europe out of the European Union. <laughs> no, no, I mean it. We don't need that flag but, anthem and all those old men telling us what to you do. You said that 17 years ago that the UK yeah. didn't believe it had happened. Who knows? That could be the future as well. What would you say the future is of US-UK relations? Such a critical alliance. Yeah, that's What's important. possible well, going forward? Absolutely. And you know, when you think just two days ago was Veterans Day and you think of the triumphs and tragedies that we have shared as a nation in the course of the last hundred years, to give liberty and freedom, mm -hmm. you know, to much of Europe and much of the world. Uh, it's, it's very regrettable that Obama took an incredibly negative view about the United Kingdom. He was happy to see us sort of parceled up yeah. and chucked into this new European state. Believe me, Donald Trump and the team around him, they get what we've done together in the past, and they want us to have a good relationship in the future. Obama came to Britain in the referendum and told us <laughs> that we'd be at the back of the line. Um, actually, I mean, I want to thank President Obama because he made the, he made the people so angry. He probably added 2% of our vote. You know. <laughs> but no, I mean, what, what Team Trump have made clear is that we'd be at the front of the line that we need to have. I mean, you know, you've got massive investments in the UK. We've got massive investments here. So in terms of trade, I'm optimistic. And NATO too, right? Well, you see, the thing about NATO is that Trump has been heavily criticized for calling into question the financial contributions that some people are making. And the truth is, America is still picking up too much of the bill. He's right about that. The other thing about NATO is, you know, we know what it was formed for nearly 70 years ago. Right. It was there, you know, against the Warsaw Pact. Ever since the Berlin Wall came down, we haven't redefined what NATO's for. You guys went through a divisive time recently, obviously with Brexit. Yeah. And, I, and I traveled to Scotland just after all of that. And it seemed like there was harmony. It didn't seem like there was all this dissent. What yeah. advice do you have for America right now? I mean, Scotland, because by the way, Scotland didn't vote for it. So, you know, here you have... Do, 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 I'll, I'll tell you the truth. There's a very large percentage of people who voted for remaining in the European Union who say, do you know what? We're Democrats. We lost that. Let's accept it. Let's get on with it. The only people moaning are the full-time professional student protesters, rather like the lot we saw here. <laughs> right. by, the way, by the way, none of them voted because they, 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 you know, they can't get out of bed. Um, and yet they're happy to go and protest. <laughs> you know, I mean, That's true. Of course it's true. Yeah. And generally, generally, people in the UK are accepting the result. There are some who'll go on protesting. There are some who'll go on moaning. But I have absolutely no down. doubt... We are getting back our independence. Mm. And what did you say? You were laughed at for a long time. When yeah. Brexit won, what did you say in your speech? Oh, I, I, I went to the European Parliament for the first speech after Brexit, and I got up to speak, and about 400 of them started booing and jeering, as they do. I'm like the sort of pantomime yeah. villain, you know. And I said, I said, when I came here 17 years ago, I said to you, I was going to take Britain out of the European Union. Well, I said, you laughed at me. But you're not laughing now. You're not laughing now. <laughs> it's a great you're not laughing. Laughing. Left here in America, not laughing now either. We love having you here now. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much.